thanks for coming. It's an amazing turnout. My name is Alex. I'm a co-founder at Creative AI. And uh, in general, we apply lots of AI techniques into creative industries. Uh, one of those is deep learning, but that's more uh, of a hobby of mine. Um, I apply um, algorithms on recent papers that I've read and uh, put them onto GitHub, including this one that I did recently called Neural Enhance. You can find the code at uh, GitHub slash AlexJC. That's all the, all the neural network. And uh, another project I did, uh, uh, this one's um, published last year at the ICCC called Neural Doodle, where you can just sketch cool things and the neural network will uh, paint that out in the style of an artist. So in this case, it's turning my doodles into a, a Renoir painting. So that's also on GitHub. And um, uh, my journey with neural networks actually started uh, a long time ago. And 15 years ago, I published an article called, uh, uh, it was a book chapter called The Dark Art of Neural Networks. And luckily, a lot of things have changed since then. And now they actually work. <laughs> and, uh, and we understand them much, much better. Like the entire academic community is kind of converged around uh, uh, deep learning and adding ideas or taking the best ideas from the field. And we've got a much better uh, theoretical understanding of how they work. Uh, the downside, however, is that deep learning is still, and it may always be uh, a dark art. So that part is not going to change. Uh, you will never understand a deep learning model as well as we understand a rule-based system or a finite state machine. And the reason for that is that their modern uh, deep learning models can be made up to, of up to a billion parameters. That's a billion floating point numbers that somehow combine together, multiply, divide. You have to uh, somehow understand how this works. And you will get a very different sense of understanding of how uh, such a model works compared to a finite state machine with a few states. Um, so what I want to give you in this talk is an overview of all the different tools that you can use to understand uh, deep learning. And starting from the, the data side of things and understanding properties of the data sets and how they can help us uh, understand uh, how that data flows through these different models. So covering the models and the computation and then finally the more the, the learning side of things and the optimization. And there are lots of different fields of, of maths that uh, help understand uh, deep learning. And I'll give you sufficient references so you can dig into it at home. Not too many equations, but uh, a lot of homework. Uh, so what is deep learning? Uh, well, ultimately, the simple answer is that you compute an output y based on an input x. And deep learning is basically making a really heavy uh, um, memory intensive, overweight, uh, bloated function f that will compute uh, y from x, but it can do things that no other thing, no other machine learning algorithm can do. But I like to think of deep learning as basically taking all the ideas of neural network that work well in practice and, and uh, moving more towards the side of software engineering. So it's a field that is typically called differentiable computing. So not just solving problems that you'd expect with neural networks, but generally building large programs that just happen to be uh, differentiable, which means we can train them using uh, gradient descents or other optimization algorithms. And this is particularly important because these two disciplines are going to merge, like software engineering and uh, deep learning are, are becoming closer and closer thanks to libraries like TensorFlow. Um, and so it's, it's very useful to understand how deep learning works a bit more formally because it's going to become such an important part of solving difficult problems uh, in the future. So when should you use deep learning? And well, the simple answer to this is that it's the same as machine learning in general. Whether you're doing a classification problem, you're predicting outputs, uh, that classes, this is a cat, a dog, that's your output Y, based on input X could be an image, or a regression problem, which is basically uh, predicting continuous values Y from the same input X. Then as kind of a special case, generation is sort of predicting uh, very large images based on very small uh, inputs. So that's kind of, deep learning is also shining in that department. That's one of my favorite applications of deep learning. So what really justifies using deep learning is actually the, the data set itself. So you need to have certain properties in your data set. In fact, I think there are three big properties of your data that justifies using deep learning. Otherwise, you might as well just use regular machine learning, uh, linear classifiers, 
Um, these three properties are a very high dimensional input. So if you're working with large images or videos or even a highly sampled uh, audio signals, then deep learning is ideally suited to this. And that's why all the progress has been made on image recognition and voice recognition and translation because there's really a lot of data there. And deep learning does it exceptionally well with it. But it also requires you to have a sufficiently uh, interesting problem. So this sort of, uh, think of deep learning as, as trying to approximate a manifold in n-dimensional space. So it's like a, a decision surface that separates true from false in, in, your, in your input space. Um, and neural networks are very good, or deep learning in general is very good at finding these complex decision surfaces. And uh, uh, if you just had a very simple decision surface, you wouldn't need a deep learning model for that. Um, the third thing is having a lot of examples. And this is almost a, a cliche of deep learning that you need a lot of data for it. But Google's uh, internal data set that they uh, wrote about in some recent papers have over 100 million images, which is completely crazy. And it allows you to be very lazy about how to approach things. You just grab that much data, and you don't have to worry so much. Um, However, it does help if you have a statistical understanding of how the data is structured. So if you have these images, it's good to have some sense of how the data is distributed. So are there more cats than dogs? And if so, we need to rebias things. Or if there are very few chairs, we may need to train the neural network a bit more on those variations to get it to, to be just as accurate at recognizing chairs than it is uh, animals, for example. So this, this is called data uh, debiasing, and it's, a, I would say, a relatively standard practice in machine learning and data science. But what deep learning is sort of increasingly doing is also doing the same thing, but in the input space. So it's a bit harder to do, because typically these input spaces are very big. Here we see a data set that's very imbalanced. There's lots of samples on the right side, but we're missing information on the left side. Um, so we could gather more examples from the left and have a much better representative picture of this data set. And uh, this uh, is more valuable than having a lot of examples that are condensed on the right side. It's better to have a nice distribution of your input data across all the dimensions that you care about. Um, this is very active and uh, important area of research. And in fact, um, Google's data set of 100,000, uh, 100 million images is actually partly automatically labeled as well. So they didn't go through all those images and manually assigning labels to them. They just understand that based on proximity or the structure of the images that uh, they have a certain tag. So they don't have to go through that whole thing manually. And that is kind of the, the essence of this field of interactive learning, being able to suggest uh, questions to humans, say, what is this? And then popping that up and getting a really valuable piece of data is better than having 10 times more data that is a very low value. Here are some references if you want to go into more detail. The slides will be available later. You don't have to scribble it down. So now we have this uh, data. We can basically uh, feed it into uh, neural models or deep learning models. I like to think of these models as um, computational graphs. So I'm not going to use the words uh, biologically inspired, or I might occasionally use the word neuron. but. Uh, Deep learning has progressed way beyond the, the biological inspiration that it originally started with. Um, now it's easier to think of these models as very large computation graphs that basically take some input and then produce some outputs with a step, uh, steps of operations in between. So on the left side, we have our input X, and that is typically uh, a tensor. So that means it's a, a 2D matrix, for example. If it's an image, if it's a, a batch of images, it might be a 3D matrix. If it's a batch of videos, it might be a 4D matrix. And then on the output, we have similarly, it's going to be an, also a tensor, which is going to be another matrix of, uh, it could be uh, Boolean values, that this is a cat, a dog, a chair, or probabilities of uh, different classes. So within this computation graph, we have even more tensors. And these are uh, potentially smaller matrices of different sizes scattered throughout the graph. And these make up the, the model, what we're going to be doing our computation with and what will be trained. It, it becomes this function f. And we have lots of little tensors uh, scattered throughout. Um, some of them will be uh, relatively small. Others will be much bigger. And it's effectively, you can think of it as a way of expressing all these different matrices that um, build up one bigger matrix multiplication with lots of custom operations in there instead. 
Um, another way to think of this is that when you specify these uh, computation graphs, in, for example, in TensorFlow, uh, you will specify what happens to your input x, and the library might not immediately know what it is, so there's some abstraction there. And then it will sort of reason about these different operations in, in this abstract way, like multiply this input times this other matrix, and then perform a nonlinear function on that, add the result, split it to two, and uh, all these different steps are specified on uh, abstract concepts. And then TensorFlow or Theano or other deep learning libraries will compile that and run it on your GPU as fast as it can. So there's two things to, to note about these uh, computation graphs. Um, is that the first is that it's important to have nonlinear functions at regular intervals throughout the graph. If you just have linear functions throughout your, your deep model, you'll end up with just another linear function. So it's going to be a really expensive linear function, which is a complete waste of time. So you want to put nonlinear functions into your, into your graph to really give it the benefits of the depth. And the deeper you go, the more uh, benefits you get as long as you add nonlinear functions. So from left to right, these are some of the most uh, common, the most popular ones. On the left is the tanh function. It's like a smooth step from minus 1 to plus 1. Uh, sigmoid looks a bit similar, except it's between 0 and 1. And they basically use this very often for, for a machine translation and sequence to sequence learning. In the middle, we've got the ReLU. It's called the rectified linear unit which is basically defined as zero on the negative infinity side, then it's the identity function on the positive infinity side. And this is used extremely often in image recognition, image processing. And then on the right side, we have uh, the LU, exponential linear function, which is kind of a mix between the two, goes from minus one smoothly transitioning into a linear function. And this is used more often in uh, image segmentation. And uh, yeah, I like this one, it's, uh, it's a good one for generative models. So the second thing to note about the computation graphs, uh, we, here we have uh, lots of linear, non-linear functions throughout the graph, but it's also good to have these residual connections. So this is a concept that's borrowed from signal processing, where you have a base signal and then you add a bit more detail on top of that. Uh, so in this case, we're going to have a separate branch that branches off and then another computation is done and then we add the result back in later. And this is important because it helps the data flow a bit more smoothly. If you can imagine a graph like this that has uh, thousands of layers, like this is the, the, the biggest depth that Microsoft has trained, uh, went up to uh, 1,500 deep uh, models. Uh, the data flows much more smoothly if you have these regular skip connections throughout the graph. So that means that when you're going forwards and you're computing these functions, it's, uh, it means you can remove parts and it still kind of works. But also when you're going backwards, it means that the, the um, training procedure has an easier time updating all the values in the neural networks. I think this is one of the biggest insights of the past couple of years, actually. Uh, it made a big difference in all the competitions. And so the tricks we've seen so far are uh, on the general side. They're reusable concepts. You can apply them uh, into like, whatever function you're, you're trying to approximate. You can use these. But there are also very specific tricks that apply to, um, for example, image processing. And this can be thought of as a node inside the computation graph. It's called a convolution filter. You might have heard the word convolutional neural networks. And this is what's going on under the hood. It's like it's taking a really small kernel or a three by three matrix and scanning it over the input image and then producing another output as a result. So you can think of this as like edge detection or pattern detection on the three by three scale and then producing the sort of uh, the output uh, grayscale image that shows how strong those edge detector edge detector were activated. So you can imagine stacking these detectors together. We have more than three, three by three matrices and just ending up with more and more output channels and they're all detecting different kinds of patterns. And those patterns then get turned into more patterns and as you make the neural network deeper, it learns um, patterns of patterns and building higher level abstractions. So on the right, you see there are gaps between the blue cells. That means we're sort of padding them with zero. That means you can do things like upsampling operations. You can also skip certain cells as well, and you can do downsampling operations. And you can change the kernel size and make it a 5 by 5 matrix. Um, and so in practice, most image recognition neural networks use layers and layers of these operations just stacked together to uh, basically form these uh, deep computational graphs that recognize images. So 
So another common pattern that's used often in uh, image, uh, not image recognition, uh, translation is the LSTM cell. So it's a long short term memory. And it, you can think of it as like a, an, a, almost a, an electric circuit that's very specifically crafted to be assembled together. So they put together like uh, thousands of these and then they stack another layer of them on top of each other and they can learn sequence to sequence translations. So uh, they're very good at uh, yeah, translating and that's what Google uses everywhere. So here are more details about the models. Um, but so far, uh, in general, deep learning is, is difficult to get right when you're trying to figure out what you need to plug together. It's a very uh, um, intuition-driven process, and this is the part where the, the dark art comes in. You need to have some sense of what's going to work, and you can do that by reading a lot of the papers in the field. So every morning I try to read some uh, PDFs from archive.org, uh, which is a, a preprint server for, uh, that the machine learning community uh, has sort of uh, converged on. So you can get papers that are related to what you're trying to solve and then get a sense of what architecture they're using and try it out. Um, but so in practice, um, if you have hundreds or thousands of GPUs available to you, uh, if you're willing to spend the money on the cloud compute, then you can use more uh, experimental testing approaches, trying out all the different variations of your architecture and seeing what comes out. It can be a bit expensive, but that makes it more of a, a methodical, uh, like an experimental science as opposed to, um, we don't yet have a full analytical understanding of how these architectures work. So in practice, what, they, what this means is that it puts more emphasis on the, the computation side of things and understanding uh, how the data flows through your neural networks. And um, that's like, important to, to understand the statistics of the data as it's progressing through the network. So in traditional machine learning, you have to, well, it's recommended that you normalize your input data, which means you want the mean to be uh, around zero and you want the standard deviation to be uh, around one. And so that has a lot of uh, benefits, like all these nonlinear functions that we talked about. If you feed in a nice uh, normal distribution into these functions, you get a mix of plus ones and minus ones or of a positive or a zero in the, in the case of the, uh, the, the middle function. Um, so this means that the neural network or the deep learning model is actually making decisions. It's actually deciding whether something should be true or false or a plus one and minus one. Whereas if you weren't normalizing your data, it might end up, in the case of this uh, tan h function, all the values might end up being uh, 1.0, in which case it's giving you no extra information about your input data. You've just lost a lot of information. Um, and these were fundamentally the problems that the machine learning community wrestled with for about 20 years until they figured out what was happening. Um, so it sounds simple, but um, it took us a while to figure out how, how things, were, uh, things were going on under, under the hood. So as you take your data and you filter it through this computational graph, like the deeper it gets, the harder it is to, to, uh, to predict what shape the data's distribution is going to have, if it's going to drift off towards infinity or if it's going to converge towards zero and end up just vanishing completely. Uh, so that will depend entirely on the kinds of uh, operations that you're using. It will depend on how you've initialized your data, how you've initialized the, the parameters. Um, and so it's generally a very difficult thing to predict um, these distributions. So the trick, and this is what brought back the, the, the deep learning uh, craze, um, is correctly initializing the parameters. So this is one of the approaches, such that your uh, output distribution is basically also a normalized uh, distribution. So if you set the certain weights and sort of biases, you can sort of shift your data's distribution around and then make sure that it, it is a normal distribution again. Um, so there's some great papers on this. This is a recent paper with a, a new approach to doing that called weight normalization. It's a, it's a well-written paper and uh, quite accessible. Um, the other approach, which is used almost everywhere, is called batch normalization. So it's basically keeping track of the mean and the uh, standard deviation of your data set as you're filtering it through the graph, and then effectively you're, uh, you can adjust it on the fly. As you, the more data you filter through it, then the better it will understand how to, to move the, the data set around. And, uh, this is a technique that allowed us to, to really um, uh, get much better results in image recognition and. Uh, it's made a significant difference. This is one of the, the, the most important techniques of the last five years. 
So as a result of applying these techniques, things like batch normalization, uh, you get a nice distribution of positive and negative results, like each of the channels inside your, your deep model making decisions positive and negative, and you end up with a nice sparse result as opposed to just having zeros everywhere. Um, so and this is what um, also made things like neural style possible because each of these different photos as you filter it through the network will have a different fingerprint or a different uh, unique identifier and it looks a bit like this. Um, so you can train for this and try and encourage these results to emerge and uh, I'm going to skip a bit quicker through that. What this means is that uh, you have certain uh, channels or certain neurons that have uh, certain activation patterns and you can remove them and network will still mostly work. So we don't want to put all of our uh, eggs in one basket. There is that, there's a certain amount of redundancy there and the, the, the systems are relatively fault tolerant thanks to these representations. And uh, yeah, you can train to encourage these representations to emerge. And uh, that, yeah, I'm gonna skip this because I'm running short on time. Uh, but that leads into the section on uh, training and gradient descent. So this is where we take all these uh, uh, the models that we've talked about and we actually train them to approximate the function that we're interested in, in learning. And uh, in general, this is also from the machine learning perspective, um, there are two functions that you can use to train a model. The first is mean error, which is you calculate the difference between what you have and what you want, and then you use that as a, as a signal to basically train the whole network. Uh, if you have um, non-continuous values, if you have like booleans, like this is a cat, a dog, then you'll use another uh, error function. It's called uh, categorical cross-entropy. And so that, these are two, um, they're not specific to deep learning there. You'll use them in, in regular machine learning uh, as well. And the way deep learning takes those signals and then trains the model is using an algorithm called backpropagation. And backpropagation combines two things. It combines the chain rule with the update rule. The chain rule is there to take the error, which is calculated on the, on the right side. We calculate uh, how far off we are from our target, and then we sort of propagate that through the graph again. And the goal is to calculate the gradient of the error. So we want to know what direction we need to adjust the weights in to get a better result. Um, so there are um, uh, derivations of how you can do this. There are some great tutorials that will have links to this. Um, I'm not going to derive that now. But as a result of applying uh, the chain rule and going back, we get a sense of what the error function looks like locally. And so we can step in the right direction to minimize that error. And, uh, that is done using an update rule. And there's a collection of, of different rules that you can use. There's the standard uh, SGD, which is stochastic gradient, gradient descent. And that's the, the, the classic. Uh, it's been around for decades. And there are others that are more recent, more modern, and they have a lot of different uh, uh, benefits. But all the bottom ones use a lot of extra memory to sort of maintain. They maintain extra per parameter uh, weights that tell it how quickly to step. So you basically get a lot of acceleration for free, but it costs you uh, memory. So uh, of all these different algorithms, um, the ones that are used the most often are the plain old stochastic gradient descent. That's the, the simplest thing you could possibly do, like just take one step in the direction of the gradient uh, based on random data. And the most, second most popular is probably Adam at the bottom, which is used very often. Eve is the uh, uh, up and coming. Um, these academics and their names. So, um, and RMS prop is also, uh, it'll come back. You, most of the time as a practitioner, you don't need to know about these. They're completely encapsulated. You just call this update rule and it just works and you don't have to worry about the details. The one thing you might have to worry about is that deep optimization or optimization of these deep graphs is a, uh, a non-convex uh, uh, problem. So it, you have no guarantees that you will reach a global minima. Um, but as it turns out, and this is very recent uh, research on the topic, it doesn't really matter that you can't prove that the global minima can't be reached because it's such a huge parameter space with over a billion different parameters. There are minimas everywhere and there's many symmetric versions of, of the solution. And as it turns out, these uh, algorithms, like the update rules, will converge often to results that are, if not the global minima, they're pretty close. And so you won't notice in practice. 
Um, so there are also some proofs that if you simplify deep learning down to some very basic primitives, then it actually is convex. So if you want what we can mathematically prove, it's not quite the state of the art, but the state of the art stuff, you don't have to worry about it. It mostly just works. Uh, the hard part is figuring out the architecture. So here are some more great tutorials that go into more detail about the, uh, the backpropagation process, and uh, I highly recommend those. And again, I'll post the slides online afterwards. So to summarize, um, data is important, but it's more important to understand the statistics of your data, make sure it's well distributed uh, across all your output categories and all your input space. The models in deep learning have progressed way beyond neural networks and biologically inspired models. They're general computation graphs that you could integrate into your software to solve problems based on data. Um, making uh, architectures and models for deep learning is difficult, but you can sort of get away with doing lots of simulations and seeing which ones work best. It's a bit computationally expensive, um, but it's quite a reliable way forward. And from the optimization perspective, you, you can't guarantee for sure that it will uh, converge, but in practice it always does. And modern deep learning libraries are very reliable. Uh, so you get very good results from them. Great, that's it for me. Thank you very much.